Hello there, welcome to my kitchen. My name is Andrew, and in this video, you're going to see me cook 30 pounds of pumpkin. This is part of a continuing series on the channel where I make a large amount of one type of produce. It started as just a fun challenge, but it's become an exercise that I've really grown to enjoy because it forces me to look at the same ingredient over and over again in quick succession, looking at it through the lens of different dishes, and learning things about ingredients that I had previously never noticed. There's something so fun about a pumpkin. The way it looks, this orange, just big, hard rock that lives on the ground. And I've always been curious, what are other ways that you can eat pumpkin? So I've already made the dishes, and now I'm gonna take you through how that experience went. So the first pumpkin thing I made is pumpkin pie. And I made pumpkin pie using fresh pumpkins and processing and roasting them myself. And I actually referenced the technique from the Tasty 101 series, How to Make the Perfect Pie. So for this pie, I actually used this type of pumpkin. When I purchased it, it was called a pie pumpkin. So I think that was kind of perfect. But they're also sometimes called sugar pumpkins. But I began by splitting the pumpkin, carving out the seeds, and then slicing them into wedges and dry roasting them at a high temperature. While that was going on, I made my crust. I'm not a very skilled baker, and baking is renowned for its precise measurements and specificity, but a pie crust is something where it also takes a bit of finesse and intuition to know, is the butter crumbled enough? Have I over mixed it? Are my hands getting too hot? I run very hot, so I was very nervous that I was just going to melt this stuff between my hands. So I was just hoping for the best. I rolled out my crust, very stressful process, fitted it into my pie dish, and then par baked it with some old dry beans that I have as a pie weight. Then it was a matter of making the filling. So I took the roasted pumpkin. I was looking at the top of this pumpkin, wondering when it was gonna get roasted, but all along it was the bottom. But I think this is sort of where you wanna take pumpkin to when you're roasting it from fresh to sort of develop the natural sugar that's in this gourd. So I separated the skin from the flesh of the pumpkin and then processed it in my blender along with cream. Then there's the typical pumpkin spices, allspice, cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, eggs, vanilla, and a mixture of white and brown sugar. So back to the crust, I removed the beans and let the crust bake for a little bit longer. Once it got to a good place, I took it out, let it cool for a moment, and in went the pie filling and baked it off first at a high temperature and then at a lower temperature until it was set. And I gotta say the color of this roasted pumpkin, I don't know, there's something very special about this sort of mahogany finish. So I let the pie cool, in fact, overnight, and unfortunately it split, which I don't know the exact cause of. It tastes great nonetheless. I really like pumpkin pie because it's something that you could really eat at any time of day. When it's not too sweet, it sort of falls in a unique category that I really enjoy. The next dish I made was hobokjuk, which is a Korean pumpkin porridge. And I referenced the recipe from Mengchi. You can see it on her website or her YouTube page. And for this dish, I actually used a kabocha squash, which is related to pumpkins and other winter gourds. It's actually what Mengchi recommends as an alternative to the sort of pumpkin that you might use traditionally for this dish. So once my kabocha was split, de-seeded, and portioned into wedges, I added this to a large pot with water and simmered for about 15 minutes. In Mengxi's recipe, she also adds some mixed beans, which I started soaking a few hours previously. In the meantime, I started working on the little rice cakes that would go in the porridge at the end. Sweet rice flour, or glutinous rice flour as it's sometimes referred, with some hot water added to it and then kneaded together until I had a homogenous dough. I set this aside to rest for a few minutes. So once it had rested, I portioned it out, rolled it into a little tube, and broke it off into little pieces, which I worked into little spheres. And then in Mengchi's version, she actually adds pine nuts to the center to be like this little nut surprise in the center of your rice cake. So once the squash was soft, I pulled the pieces out and removed the skin before returning it to the pot so that it could all be mashed together. Next we season, return it to a simmer with the appropriate amount of water added back. Then the rice cakes are added to the porridge itself, along with some additional rice flour mixed with water to thicken the porridge. Once the rice cakes are floating, they're done. And that was it. I really enjoyed this dish. My biggest surprise tasting this dish was 
how nice it is tasting something that is comprised of just one flavor, pretty much. I think my instinct is always to wonder, okay, were there aromatics simmered at the start? Was there a certain flavorful stock added to make it? But this porridge shows that you can make something complete and satisfying with just one thing when that thing is really good and delicious. It was very comforting and warm and the little rice cakes were really a delight to eat. The next dish I made was calabaza and tacha. I also saw this dish called calabaza and dulce, but it's essentially Mexican candied pumpkin. And for making this dish, I referenced a recipe from Melly Martinez and her cooking blog, Mexico in My Kitchen. Many of the recipes that I saw suggested that it was most traditionally made with a pumpkin variety called Calabaza de Castilla. I couldn't find this exact pumpkin, but I was able to find a very similar pumpkin. Not sure exactly what it was because it was just labeled pumpkin, but it may very well be this other variety called a fairy tale pumpkin. So I started by dissolving these piloncillo cones, which are essentially unrefined cane sugar. I put these in a pot with cinnamon, orange slices, and water until those cones were dissolved. And essentially the pumpkin just simmers away in this syrup for 20, 30 minutes, maybe more, just until that flesh is tender. I then removed the pumpkin from the pot and set those aside while I reduced the liquid in that pot so that it was more of a syrup consistency. Then the pumpkin returned to the pot to just sort of be glazed and coated in this syrup. And that was pretty much it. This was really good. It's very nice to have the pumpkin coated in this syrup, but still have the sort of pure pumpkin flavor in the center of a chunk. In the recipe I referenced, Melly suggests eating it in a bowl of warmed milk, which I could not pass up. And to me, this was the best. Just the sort of natural level of sweetness in the milk over this very sweet chunk of pumpkin. This recipe definitely gets the best smell infused into my entire home award. The next dish I made was an Afghan pumpkin dish called Borani Kadu. And I referenced a recipe from Miriam on the website Afghan Cooks, who's also a YouTube channel. Like with every dish, there's a lot of variation in technique. I noticed that sometimes the pumpkin was fried at the start, sometimes ginger was present or not, sometimes there were chilies, but I referenced this one because I was interested in this overall technique and combination of flavors. So in researching this dish, most people mention that the classic pumpkin that you might find in Afghanistan is not gonna be readily available. Lots of people sub in butternut squash or suggest using some other sweet winter squash. So I chose to use the rest of my kabocha that I used previously with the hobup juke. I then cut the kabocha into small, thick, manageable planks. So the pumpkin is essentially simmered in a sauce. So first we have to make the sauce. And I started by sauteing an onion and then making a combination of minced ginger and garlic. That gets sauteed together. I added some green chili. I added some tomato paste, which I allowed to cook in the bottom of the pan before adding some fresh tomato and letting that all simmer together. I then added the spices, cumin, coriander, and turmeric, as well as some salt, and let that all cook together for 15 minutes or so. When the sauce was looking nice, I added the kabocha chunks. So after 20 minutes or so, the pumpkin was tender, and then it was time to plate. Miriam has a yogurt sauce in the recipe as well. A little bit of that on the bottom, piled up my pumpkin, and then drizzled some more yogurt on top to complete the dish. And this was so good. The general technique of simmering some vegetable in a flavorful sauce is so powerful, but the combination of the earthiness of this squash, the gentle sweetness of it, along with all these spices, and the combination of cool dairy with something spicy and hot, one of the best. The last dish I made was camarão na marenga, which is a Brazilian shrimp stew stuffed pumpkin. And for making this dish, I referenced a recipe from the website Olivia's Cuisine. This is actually something that I've had before in Brazil a bunch of years ago. And when I was thinking about making this video, I was like, you know, how many things can you do with pumpkin? And then I remember, oh yeah, I had this dish in Brazil. I can't wait to make this. And to start, I removed the top, scooped out the insides. I then made a mixture of onion and garlic with just a little bit of oil, which I rubbed all over the inside of the pumpkin before closing it back up, wrapping it in foil, 
and then roasting it in the oven until a bit tender. To make the filling, I first marinated the shrimp in some lime juice and salt. I then briefly sauteed them, then removed those from the heat, and then cooked the aromatics, which were onions and garlic, and then tomatoes, as well as some bell pepper. I then added some flour, which will serve to thicken the stew later, and then some cream and milk. And then added back the shrimp, along with all of its juices, as well as some cilantro. So once the pumpkin was tender, I actually used a spoon to sort of scrape up some of the tender flesh to mix in the bottom of the pumpkin with a bit of cream cheese. So this is one of the elements that's very difficult to recreate. Brazil has very particular dairy products, in particular this cheese called catupiry. This is one of those things where to recreate it, it's not the exact ingredients that I'm looking for, but rather a combination that will achieve a similar final flavor. And then the finished stew is filled into the pumpkin, and then finally topped with a bit of Parmesan cheese before going back in the oven to just sort of heat everything together and melt that cheese. And that's it. A giant pumpkin filled with a shrimp stew. And let me tell you, this is so good. It's such a beautiful combination of, you know, dairy and pumpkin, like these warm, comforting flavors, and then shrimp and lime juice and garlic, these like exciting flavors. It's really something else. And the effect of looking at a full pumpkin filled with a shrimp stew cannot be understated. It is so good. So that's how I cooked 30 pounds of pumpkin. Thank you for joining me on this very fun and delicious experience. I hope you learned something. I certainly did. And if you have any recommendations on what I should make in the future, please suggest in the comments.